Sir, you can start. Good afternoon to all of you. This uh, program of webinar talks is arranged by, as part of the outreach program of the Ministry of Earth Sciences. And I am delivering the 13th of such talks. So today, we will be dealing with the basics in geosciences. So I am Dr. Nanda Kumar from the National Center for Earth Science Studies in Tiruvannandapuram. So before starting this, I will give you an overview of what I am going to present today. This is with respect to our Mother Earth. Because as you know, we are dealing, National Center for Earth Science Studies is dealing with uh, many facets of geosciences or earth system sciences under which solid earth science is being carried out as the most prominent uh, science. So we are dealing with many things which will be of interest to the general public, the academic people, and the students. Since it is so basic, I have defined the talk in such a way that this is palatable also to most of the audience. Otherwise, uh, if I use more in a hard way, it will not be good. So we are dealing with like that. So with this small introduction, I and uh, I wish to thank our Honorable Secretary, Dr. M. Rajivan, for giving me the opportunity to talk in this webinar series. So with this, I wish our presentation will start now. So. Please, ah, yes. So the figure that is seen in the center has fascinated me from 1972 onwards. This is a figure, internationally famous one. This is called Blue Marble, taken by Apollo 11, Apollo 17, astronauts from space. See the beauty of the blue marble in which we can see the Arabian Peninsula and the African continent and the Horn of Africa. So this is a beautiful celestial body which they saw, the Mother Earth. And oceans are there, Madagascar also we can see. So, but this has got a history of almost 4.6 billion or billion years. And the continent that we see in this blue marble is a end product of several cycles of, deadly cycles of continental collision and dispersal. And that things I will come slowly uh, later on. See the position of the Earth in the solar system. As we know, solar system is one among several solar systems in the universe. Everything which started from the Big Bang as a singularity has proliferated into all these different nebulas, different uh, you know, planetary systems in the space. But see the beauty of the Earth. As the third planet near to the sun, see, it is, how did, so we will look into how the solar system formed.
we should understand that sun is giving us energy it is in the center of the solar system the planets and the sun they all formed at the same time and from the same material as the sun and there is a hypothesis that is formed you know that is the nebular hypothesis which generally says that it is formed from a giant cloud of mostly hydrogen and helium and a small percentage of heavier elements and as we know nuclear synthesis is what that happened and from all the all the elements in the periodic table is formed due to the interaction of these two elements basic hydrogen and helium so this is this will give you a picture of how the nebular hypothesis what is nebular hypothesis see the first picture on top this is a cloud of <clears throat> gas and dust and that is what is called solar nebulae with a bright spot in the center and that is where the nuclear fusion reaction is happening and where sun is getting formed and the collapse of nebula under its own gravity formed a rotating disk around the dense core of material this core eventually become hot enough to form the sun and later on after 120 million years later of 4.6 billion years the remaining planetary bodies all accreted so planets formed at the same time from the cloud of dust and gases called nebulae 80 percent hydrogen five percent helium and five percent heavier elements see this is how it formed see during the accretion time heavier elements sank to the centers of the planets forming the course of the planet the process of separating these elements according to their mass and density is called chemical differentiation see this is how when we look closer uh, into the earth this is how it is envisioned i will tell you the geoscience as such draws tools from various other sciences so we can call the geosciences a secondary or a tertiary level science so look at the picture wherein we have gone into the depth of the earth i told you a majestically moving body of in the space what apollo uh, 17 people have seen now we are going inside of that that is the crest is the thin veneer of the ball or the spheroid which is 5 to 40 kilometers then inside the crest we have the mantle and then inside that is 2895 uh, kilometers in depth from the uh, bottom of uh, this crust then we have 2270 kilometer outer core see the core is both out divided into two one is outer core and the inner core outer core is generally liquid or fluid in nature whereas the inner core is metallic in nature and the components we have identified as nickel and iron so when you see the earth i told you that this geoscience is drawing uh, you know tools from other sciences so how we have probed into the earth's interior how we knew that earth's interior is molten so this picture is showing so based on seismological analysis we found that during a earthquake there are basically uh, three or four types of waves generated one is the p wave and 
the other is the S wave, and the surface waves are Rayleigh waves and uh, you know L waves. So during an earthquake, as you look inside, you can see that the P waves travels and it is getting refracted due to something inside. Whereas the ES wave, which is uh, black uh, arrows, is not at all penetrating the middle portion of the earth. And that is purely it is giving a shadow on the other side. No yes waves are received anywhere on the opposite side. So that means this S waves called otherwise shear waves, as we know, even otherwise, it is not transmittable through fluids or through liquids. That, you know, gave rise to the notion that the middle of the earth is purely liquid. And uh, this is one epicenter and the other waves. So the upper 410 kilometer down, that is a discontinuity, wherein it is a mineral discontinuity. It, it is also indicating, uh, you know, the change in velocity of these P waves as well as uh, S waves. And so that is the low velocity layer is in 20 to 20, uh, 60 to 20, 2000, uh, sorry, 220 kilometers. There is a one more discontinuity which is very prominent as far as uh, uh, plate tectonics is concerned that is 660, some people say it is 670, but 660 uh, discontinuity, what you call, wherein I told mineral discontinuities are also there. One mineral is getting converted to another mineral due to the uh, physical pressure exerted there. So the silicon, uh, that four valencies turn to six valencies. So spinel is getting into sky type of minerals. So lower mantle has more gradual velocity increase. So as I earlier told, the core is mainly metallic. As I told you during the differentiation, the heavier elements sank into the core and that is the iron nickel alloy, which is, uh, I told you, there is no waves it will pass through liquid. That's why the shadow zone. And due to exceeding pressure, this liquid is converted into solid, uh, so the inner core is believed to be solid in nature. So I now am just introducing you to a modern theory that is called the plate tectonics theory. This plate tectonics basically we have seven major plates and there are several minor plates also. What you see is the disposition of the seven major plates. The seven major plates, as you see, this Eurasian plate, then North American plate, then Pacific plate, then Indian Australian plate, then we have the South American plate and uh, we have the African plate and Antarctic plate. So there are uh, seven major plates. This plate tectonics theory, it unifies us, the various concepts under which volcanoes are formed, under which, uh, you know, we can explain about uh, uh, what, what was uh, in the past and what could be the future disposition of the continents also. And a lot of, uh, you know, earthquakes are, can also be, uh, you, we can explain how these are generated. Maybe in the coming slides, we will talk on that. So I told you that in plate tectonic regimes, and these are, is a schematic diagram, which is showing how, where, in which situation, in which tectonic environments we can find a uh, generation of magma or melts. See, these are all typical conditions. 
wherein see the first number number 1 it is the mid ocean ridges as we know the atlantic mid ocean ridge is very famous one then second number number 2 that is in indra continental rifts rift valley africa that's a important example of that then we have a volcanic this magma generation happening in island arcs we have active continental margins we have back arc basins very much connected with island arc situation then we have ocean island basalts number 6 which is very interesting in which like uh, hawaiian islands where in lot of lava is still erupting out then the ocean island basalts then miscellaneous intracontinental activities due to like ex- exemplified in kimberlite pipes carbonatites and uh, maybe anorthosites <clears throat> this is this picture what you see is giving you an idea about how i told you that there are seven major plates how the plates a plates always moves many that is the dynamism of this planet our earth i told you majestically moving but internally dynamic so the three reasons for the see first of all the driving mechanism i should tell is because of its heat that is coming out so there are three reasons for this internal heating mechanism one from impact during the earth's formation that is the primordial heat that happened in 4.6 billion years ago still retained inside the earth's bowel then number 2 is radioactive decay of uranium thorium potassium very much common in uh, granitic rocks these are still radiating lot of heat and melting can be initiated due to the heat that is emanating out of these elements heavy elements then the heat released as inner core forms i told you that the heat is already there in the core that's why the 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 outer core is still remaining fluid which is a blessing in this case i will come to that later on and the ways to transfer heat so there are two major ways of transfer of heat one is conduction that is you know for all physics students they may know there are one more that is radioactive heat also is there we have but as far as the plate tectonics driving mechanism is concerned we are having conduction and convection of materials that is very important and when you see the figure the outer mantle is actually moving along with the plates but there are some eddy currents as you see in the inner mantle which are really the driving force that uh, keeps the plate moving and as you see in hawaii what is happening is the outpouring of the lava is coming from deep from inside the core mantle boundary and see when you talk about core mantle boundary see the subducting plates see here in this that uh, that arc either in chile trench or the other arc see the crust the lithospheric crust is moving down and it is going into this core mantle boundary which is very important and uh, you can see the vestiges of earlier plates that might have subducted and it is seen in the uh, that uh, uh, lower mantle layer and these are all highly significant for uh, plate tectonics activities and we will move to the next uh, so i told that uh, the inside earth 
we have the core and the outer core is fluid in nature or liquid core and that is giving i told it is a blessing in disguise but it is giving us the most important property of earth is magnetism and the magnetic field is generated by an organized flow of electrons in the molten outer core a theory is there it is when the due to earth's rotation the elements i told lion nickel and all they themselves will move and cut across mild magnetic lines and electrical field is created which will give the concept of that has given the concept of self exciting dynamo and this dynamo is working so we have the magnetic north pole we have the south pole and geographic north pole is little different uh, it is physically separated from the magnetic north pole and <clears throat> see this is offset i told that the next diagram this is the second one the north pole is uh offset by 23.5 with the magnetic north pole geographic north pole is little different from north pole every year this pole also wanders from position to position that's also a phenomena that is still getting studied by the geoscience uh, people and see this figure is giving you an idea about the reversals of magnetic fields see i just uh, you know this um, uh, human beings what we are seeing is just a uh, illustration but in the first slide in 330000 years ago see the north pole would have been in the south means southern direction south bottom of the figure whereas today as we know the north pole is in the north uh, so i am just telling you the earth's magnetic field reverses its polarity on an irregular time scale of a few tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of years and that is not coming in a regular fashion recordically geologists have uh you know are known about 183 reversals in 83 million years see for the common man's understanding millions of years our life scale is only maximum is 80 90 100 years but geologists deals with millions of years that's why i told the beginning of the earth happened 4.6 billion years ago so this is the geological significance of the earth's magnetism see in the volcano or in the strata that erupted at regular intervals we see each strata is magnetized in different directions so that is it is only a schematic diagram to make you understand that earth can record the magnetization and that magnetization can be dated also and that is what is called paleomagnetic you know domains that are present in the different lava flows that happened so magnetic reversals are recorded in igneous rocks by the remnant field orientations frozen into by the magnetic minerals like magnetite it is a very important mineral that can record it next <clears throat> this is accomplished i told that can be dated also and uh, uh, there are several methods to date igneous rocks that i will come later on so now i am going into the core of plate tectonics i think up to this level my uh, wonderful audience have understood what uh the magnetism is what is the inside the earth and things like that see this is a i am now going to introduce a very famous concept in geoscience so in 
Alfred Wagner, he published his theory of continental drift. See, <clears throat> whenever we say colloquially when we talk, you remain as solid as earth, people will say. But earth is not as solid, I will, I will explain to you. So this is the theory is continental drift. So he hypothesized, that scientist, he hypothesized the existence of a supercontinent called Panjaya. So almost approximately 200 million years ago, <clears throat> Panjaya broke into smaller pieces which drifted to their present positions. This is an appearance, a paleogeographic reconstruction of the various continents disposition uh, about 200 million years ago, the supercontinent called the Panjaya. I told you this is a, a, a amalgamation of the present Africa, the present uh, Arabian Peninsula. They are after a series of the result of a series of deadly cycles of continental collision and dispersal. So the Panjaya has been, uh, there are several continents in one supercontinent, like we call the Gondwana land, which is south of the equator, which comprises of South America, Africa, India, Antarctica, and Australia. Whereas the north is called Laurasia, which holds Asia, then we have North America and many other continents. This figure give you an idea. The first figure on the left uh, top, see the Laurasia, then the Gondwana, and the Tati Sea is forming, and the other sea is Pandalasa. <clears throat> that is a sea that ha was there in the under ocean was called Pandalasa when uh, in 200 million years ago. So in 100 million years, so the transformation you can see. In 140 million years ago, something changed, disposition changed. You can see India there. India started moving towards north. And maybe it will hit Eurasia that we will, in course of time, we can see. And 65 million years ago, a slight improvement has happened. <clears throat> and in the present, see, on the right bottom, India is with Eurasia. So if you look at it in the scale of a human life, you may not be able to decipher what is happening. But if you look into the, uh, the, the movements of continents in millions of years time scale, you can know the appreciable movement of the continents, what I am explaining here now. See, this is 140 million years to the present. Just see the movement of India. It is one of the fastest recorded movement of continents in the, in the whole geological history. So it moved so quickly and it has hit the Eurasia. Just for uh, curiosity, once more, we are playing it. See how it hit. <clears throat> these are all not fiction, my friends. These are all something which are evidence-based. This is another diagram showing a continent-continent collision of India with Asia and the formation of the mighty Himalayas, which is pride to India and uh, it, it gives a lot of uh, useful things to India. So I will come later on. See, the mountains as such has got a lot of influence in, uh, you know, determining the weather patterns. The Himalayan mountain and elevated Tibetan plateau produced the adiabatic heating over a large area of middle troposphere in summer. This is differential heating and a significant role in seasonal monsoon waves. So Himalaya also protects India from the cold there. Otherwise, up to maybe Andhra Pradesh or uh, Telangana or Tamil Nadu, 
it would be a different story it would have been a different story minus himalayas so uh, as far as weather pattern and climate is concerned and see the uh, apart from himalayas there was 10 gods but i'm sitting uh, in southern uh, kerala see it also gives you blocks the monsoon winds and from arabian sea and the cause of high rainfall in southwest india that is it plays a orographic control it plays a lot of role in monsoon of onset of monsoon monsoon weather and the hydrological regime of the entire region <clears throat> i told i was speaking about the continental drift theory and uh, see there are some evidences that uh, we are not telling from as i told not from fiction but certain clinging evidences are there and they are like this like uh, why we are telling that mountains are moving so that is and this is these are the evidences that geologists found out rocks of similar age and structure are found in different maybe adjoining or the best fit land fits of the continents like in appalachians and uh, in the other uh, <coughs> Yeah, British Isles and Scandinavia, we have similar rocks. And what are the paleoclimate evidence? See, glacial deposits, can you believe? We have glacial deposits in India, we have glacial deposits in Africa, we have glacial deposits in South America, we have glacial deposits, of course, in Australia and in Antarctica. See, now the glacial deposits, the position of the continents now, as we know, glaciers are something which are generated from ice and moving ice. And the, it can form, it cannot form in a, in, normally in a uh, equatorial environment or in the tropics. It can form in the poles, but see, there, uh, you know, even ice can be formed as far as when the height increases, ice can form. In Himalayas, we are still running glaciers. But the glaciers, in an all-pervasive manner, continental scale is what I am telling. And that is a good evidence. And several other evidence I told about shape fit South America and uh, the western part of uh, uh, Africa. See, that is that can be fitted. So. There are several, this Horn of Arabia also can be fitted. If you minus that Red Sea, what is the, what will be the case? Africa is, Africa can be amalgamated with uh, uh, this Arabian Peninsula. So there are certain clinging evidences. And glacial striations, of course, which extends to various continents. Then tropical forests present in Antarctica. See, the fossils that are, uh, generally found in the tropics, how it is seen in Antarctica. That is also a question, an enigma. Then the Glossopteris flora, the Gengamopteris flora, these are all present. Jurassic, you know, aged uh, fossils found in various continents which are marked in there. And the most clinging evidence is the magnetic pole reversal. And see the biological evidence mammals like listrosaurus and mesosaurus they are seen in south america and africa this person cannot swim in sea water but the land now is separated previously it was one that's why the continental drift hypothesis we are coming forth with so i told the most uh, this wegener alfred wegener when his book was translated to English, was greeted with a whole lot of criticism. And the main objections were there was no clear drift mechanism. And see, the seafloor was believed to be static, fixed, and very old. The radiometric dating was not developed till 1950s. Most of our knowledge of the seafloor was based on the original surveys by HMS Challenger Global Expedition carried out in 1850s. 
So Alfred Beckner's continental drift idea pushed back till 1950s because people were confused what this fellow is telling. We are uh, living in a stable continent and he is telling that it has moved. So let us see. So when the field of military oceanography began to mature, new discoveries on the seafloor led to the hypothesis of seafloor spreading proposed by American scientists Hess and Diet. See how he arrived at it. This is, I told, rock magnetism will give you a wonderful record of the existence. At least it will point the North Pole during the time of its crystallization. So certain minerals like magnetite, when it is heated and cooling and precipitated out of a molten rock or volcano, Below the Curie point, it will record the magnetic direction. <clears throat> and so this polar wandering, I told that poles move. Even one year, it can move a significant distance. So based on measuring the remnant magnetic fields preserved in rocks, we have led to a discovery of polar wandering, which suggested that the poles have wandered. Either the poles have wandered or the continents have drifted, which is true. So, there are different types of plate boundaries when we deal with plate tectonics, the major one. See, one is convergent boundary, the divergent boundary, and the transform boundaries. See, well, you can see the transform boundaries in the blue, the divergent boundaries in the red, and convergent boundaries in that lilac color. See, this is what how the plate is moving in the mid-oceanic ridge, in the divergent boundary. See, the plates are moving away. And in the in that North American plate, there is a transform boundary. And in the transform boundary, the earthquake is around a magnitude of 8 and not very deep but shallow, 25 kilometers, as you see. That is because the crust of the lithosphere, the thickness is just like that at 20, 25 earthquakes are produced. That is due to some breakage. And in the divergent boundary, we have a little higher scale magnitude 6. Uh, 10 kilometer depth is the uh, is the focus of most of the earthquakes in divergent boundaries. But in convergent boundaries, the plates are moving down, and it is at 700 kilometers, maybe or less. Earthquakes are generated, and the earthquakes are having high magnitude of. 9.5, you know, in the Richter scale, which is terrible. And I'm just, I don't know whether our people, maybe not many of our Indian people must not have experienced how an earthquake will be like maybe 2.5 Richter scale or 3 Richter scale. They can only, uh, you know, think about it from the news that they are getting from the newspapers and all. But the people of Delhi, near Himalayas, near Latur, we have terrible experiences about earthquake activity. And this is this figure is just, uh, you know, next, this slide is showing you how, what are the different continental, the plate boundary settings that exist in the world. That is one is ocean, ocean collision, then, then ocean continent collision is as the first, uh, Figure second is ocean ocean and the third is continent continent which is significant uh, where Himalayas have formed. <clears throat> Next. Yeah, but when you talk about uh, the settings and generation of magma, there are certain important deposits, economically viable, important deposits also are formed. And as we see, they form in specific environments. So this is a Rift Valley setting, maybe intracontinental and epicontinental 
environments we are dealing with. The intracontinental part, if you see like the Rift Valley of Africa, see the red bed. See, these are notional pictures which give an idea where a different type of minerals are formed, like nickel, copper, uranium is found well in the rocks in the inside of the continents. And see, Mississippi Valley type MVT deposits are formed in the carbonate rocks, very in the epicontinental region. And the entire metallogeny, we have to just, I'm just skipping uh, because there are so many things to learn about it in continent, continent collision margins. They have the sites of great porphyry copper, as you see, see. And while inboard the arc, significant tin tungsten granitoid hosted mineralization, if you see the down figure, all the plus that uh, bubble like uh, bodies are granite bodies, wherein surely we are getting this uh, tin tungsten deposits. And here, another tectonic setting is uh, ocean ocean collision areas, wherein the most important deposit is copper, porphyry copper deposit. But here, we are having a very typical type of calcalkaline magnetism, which give rise to Kuroko type volcano uh, massive sulfide deposit, volcanogenic massive sulfide deposits. You know, these Kuroko type deposits in Japan, they are the most famous deposits in the world that's found in Japan. And this arc arc collision zones also very, very economically significant, wherein we get to this Podiform copper and sulfur segregations that are seen. And here, the arc continent accrete ophiolites, means that is a abducted crustal and partially mantle rocks that are abducted into the crust during subduction zones. There, it is also economically very important, wherein we can get uh, lithophile, light element, lithophile elements like barium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, calcium, etc. And ultimately, the oceanic crust is totally consumed to form a zone of continent continent collision. And this Mississippi Valley type lead sink deposits. See, in, in Houston, in America, in Mississippi Valley, you have to experience how these deposits, the extensive deposits, are formed with lead sink. But there is a slight difference between Mississippi Valley type and sedimentary exhalative deposits. One is copper sink and Mississippi Valley type is lead sink. That is the difference. And this is how it gives you a world deposition of uh, disposition of various metallogenic provinces or different types of uh, you know deposits that we see in the world. And this is I told you that this gives this figure gives you an idea of uh, different sort of earthquakes in put in one figure, like shallow earthquakes, intermediate earthquake, deep earthquakes, and volcanoes. I told these plate boundaries are really tricky, wherein we are finding, uh, as you know, in round the Pacific, you see the ring of fire, wherein lot of volcanoes are there in this particular area. And this is very, very informative uh, picture. <clears throat> Next. So this is an anatomy of a volcano. I think this is uh, taught in the school level classes also. So I'm not going into it details how the volcano magmatic chamber, how it is coming out, the summit of the crater and flank. Next slide. <clears throat> So these are different types of volcanic eruptions. Generally, you know, there are more types, but I am telling you two different classes like central eruption and fissure eruption. This, has, uh, this is still in vogue, uh, this type of activity. But this is an anatomy of a typical volcanic uh, rock or a volcanic volcano, wherein explosive eruption is happening. As and when the fluidity reduces, explosiveness will become more. When the fluidity is more, 
it will come like a fissure eruptions of fluid basalts, which is not that explosive. This is this can be called as Mount Helens or in USA, this type of eruption is happening. <clears throat> and uh, what determines if an eruption is magma composition? I told more silica, more viscous. It's more explosive. Magma temperature, hotter magma, less viscous. So basalt will be having, ho the hotness will be more and it will be uh, less viscous. And the amount of gas can increase the fluidity and it can also lead to explosiveness of the um, volcanoes. Just, just to classify the whole world uh, volcanoes into shield volcanoes and composite volcanoes. See, low profile base basaltic lavas flows are thin and travel far from the source, whereas composite volcanoes are symmetrical in form, beautiful volcanoes, uh, scenic beauties for the composite volcanoes. <clears throat> Next. See, during, uh, during the, I told the fissure eruptions, we have two different types of lava flows. One is a slightly thicker form. This is called AA, and this is a little uh, sluggishly moving uh, one, which is uh, for approximately 5 to 50 meters, 5 to 50 meters. I told you the stratovolcanoes are beautiful. See, Mount Fiji in Japan, and Mount Mount in Philippines, and, and this also is having some stratiform volcanoes, whereas Sunset Crater, these are all, the, I just to exemplify the beauty of the volcano, but if the volcanoes give you the most rich soil in the world, wherein a lot of biotar can grow, it is uh, iron, magnesium, calcium rich, base rich soils are there. So, um, the, uh, the biological population thriving in those areas also will get some qualities from the soil of volcanic rocks. So these are some of the very interesting fissure eruptions. That is very famous one, the mid-oceanic, mid-Atlantic ridge. And uh, see the, see, we in India, we have a very important rock type called the Deccan volcanic province, which is basaltic in nature. And this basaltic, uh, this, uh, you know, Deccan tribes, as we call, are the results of two hotspots, Marian hotspot and Reunion hotspot. The Marian hotspot is uh, responsible for Madagascar separation. And uh, this Reunion hotspot is uh, responsible for uh, our Deccan volcanism. Just see how the animation is telling you the top you are getting the ears going on like a meter and see just come down. The, the, the one plus is Marion and the other is Reunion. See how beautifully it is depicted. That is Reunion and Marion is south. Yeah. Down bottom and see when it coincides with Madagascar and India, it is uh, it is erupting the volcano and see it is erupting the basalt and leading to the separation of these two continents, Madagascar and India. And India is vastly moving north. See when it reaches our Mumbai Dakan area, volcanism happens. And now see the trail in the ONGC drills all available after six kilometers depth. We are getting basalt in the offshore of Kerala and Mumbai. See, that is why it is God. <clears throat> so these are all the subduction zones. We will just quickly. And see, I told you regarding the earthquakes, and there are different type of earthquakes. See, just to uh, make you understand, we will switch on the animation. Just see how the earthquakes are generated. See, it's basically a fault is required. Fault is like some pressure is getting, stress is building up, and uh, after a certain, beyond a certain limit, it, it breaks, and see the earthquake is coming. And the pink one is the station where you can see the recording of uh, first P wave, then S waves, and then surface wave. This is what uh, is uh, shown. 
And this gives you an idea about the focus and the epicenter. Uh, it is the straight uh, line from the focus to the top, and that is the fault wherein uh, these blocks move. <clears throat> and these are the different types of faults, uh, which is uh, normal fault, reverse fault, and shearing forces will strike slip fault. Due to this fault mechanism, earthquakes are generated. And this is the same picture the focus I already discussed about the same story I've already discussed. And these are all the seismic stations that are found uh, established by NCS, National Center for Seismology, our sister institute uh, under MOS. They have deployed all the, uh, you know, seismic broadband seismic stations to understand the earthquakes. <clears throat> and see, we all know about this this, uh, uh, what he called, uh, tsunamis. They are hazards. What are tsunamis? They are giant waves caused by earthquakes or volcanic eruptions under the sea. What you see is a Tiruvallur statue in the background wherein huge, uh, you know, 94, I think, huge tsunami waves hit it. So they can travel, the tsunami wave, when it is in the deep ocean, can travel at the speed of a jet. But when it comes to the shore, the height of the wave increases, but actually the, uh, the movement is slowed down. It will not be moving in that speed, but it will create havoc in the area. So this is how we have a tsunami warning system established in three centers. One is Pacific Ocean Center, then Indian Ocean Center, and in the Mid-Atlantic Center. And India is managing a string of uh, you know, uh, this uh, pressure sensors <clears throat> in the bottom, that is uh, uh, in Incois, uh, they are managing this. And uh, so these are the global distribution uh, of tsunami sources in Japan, almost 20%. Uh, uh, and then this is related, this figure is showing um, how the, what are the type of earthquakes uh, wherein, uh, how it is generated also. Uh, this is a picture I am showing you the devastation, how this happens in the coastal areas of tsunami stricken uh, islands and tsunami genic zones. Um, there are in this arc region in the, just uh, below the Andaman Islands, we have a lot of tsunami genic zones wherein we, we we got the tsunami uh, historical sites, and this is this is a, uh, a disaster in disguise. We have uh, thrust faults uh, just at the plate boundaries south of the Indian Ocean. Anytime it can generate a tsunami, also. So just to show you, uh, we are in the danger zone uh, of tsunamis. Both the western and the southern part and eastern part are. Uh, you know, vulnerable. And this is how the, we manage in INCOIS, the warning system. Uh, these are all the sensors deployed and this is how we are, uh, the diagram on the left side, top side, it will give you how this is done. Uh, okay, this is based, satellite based. And if I, if I don't tell you about landslides that is killing almost many people in, uh, in, in India, uh, that's not good. So this is a hazard. Basically, you know, in mass movements, these are all the various scenarios of landslide destruction that happen to life and property, uh, in especially in the Western uh, Ghats. And see, almost more than 50 percentage of India is affected, can be affected or could be affected with landslides. So landslide basically, one is due to earthquake and rainfall, and in the, that is near the Himalayas. In the central portion, it can be due to rainfall. Whereas in the Western Ghats, what we find is during monsoons, we are all under alert and mostly uh, uh, the earth fails in the form of landslides. So, and very, very, I'm coming to the close of my talk, very, I'm moving forward. So we have time. Time is very important, I told you. In geology, we have two different types of dating methods. One is 
relative dating and the other is absolute dating. So relative dating, this had been there for long before the invention of absolute dating. We all dated because geological books, if you see, they all speak about original horizontality, cross-cutting relationship, a lateral continuity, rule of inclusions and all. So just to show you the, uh, that is a thing in the bottom, the, the rocks at the bottom is oldest and the rock at the top is youngest. And just to understand the law of superposition only, just move. So this is how generally all stratas are deposited horizontally and then due to tectonic forces it can tilt also. Next. See, this is a sedimentary rock layer which has been tilted. We see now this is, but generally uh, these rock layers are deposited in the horizontal way, but it is tilted. <clears throat> so this figure itself can show you different stories. The dike A, it is cutting, it is the youngest of all the formations which has cut across the entire formations. And you see the sill, you can see that dike B is giving you the sill, dike B. It is giving you the sill. So up to that, it is younger to all the other formations below. So like that, we can explain a lot. <clears throat> So this is a very famous site called the Sicker Point, wherein the time of 80 million years was first found. And that is called the, it is the Sicker Point uh, in the uh, western shore of, sorry, in the eastern shore of UK, uh, near to Scotland, near to Edinburgh. And wherein uh, Hutton, James Hutton, who was generally regarded as father of geology, first indicated the, uh, the time gap that that is called the first unconformity in the world and the birthplace of modern geology. See the two different tiltings of the rock uh, formations. Next. So just to make you understand that unconformities are of different types, angular unconformity, disconformity and nonconformity, they are geological terms. Uh, angular unconformity, the the dip and strike varies from the with the different strata. So this is so just to know show you. Previously we know about old and young, but now we know about 140 million years, 120 million years. How is it possible? Next, see earlier I told you the paleontology, the index fossil in particular Cambrian will have. The trilobites, that is the index fossil. So like with index fossil found in a particular strata, you will get an understanding of what will be the age. And here, this paleoclimate is another facet of modern geology wherein we can understand the climate uh, that are trapped within the uh, bowels of rocks. The first one is ice core studies. Maybe NCPR is doing uh, ice core studies. In general, if you drill an ice core of 3.5, uh, sorry, sorry 3,500 meters depth, 3.5 kilometers, you can get to know about 8 lakhs or years back uh, worth of, uh, you know, what are the climate present and what are the, uh, you know, elements present like uh, CO2, like, uh, methane and the temperature you can understand and uh, this always isotope study will give you an understanding of how the lighter elements are evaporated and how deposition is happening when you uh, so depending on the isotopic ratios found in various rocks we can understand whether the rock is formed during a condition of uh, flat season or a drought season like that and <clears throat> okay, this is uh, giving you an idea about the absolute ages and this is very much interesting. Uh, one zircon, uh, two zircons are shown. This is how dating is done. Uh, we sputter or we bombard the zircon different areas with uh, lasers. From there we will get an idea about uranium lead dating and uh, oxygen isotopes and like that. So this is the Geological time scale, most of the students are aware of. 
like Archean, Proterozoic, uh, then Cambrian, Odyssey, Paleozoic, Proterozoic, Archean, uh, then uh, the recent ones like uh, uh, tertiary, uh, quaternary ter uh, tertiary and all. So this is a geological time scale uh, that has been brought out by Geological Society of America. So what, how the geoscientists can be used in future? See, these are very important slides which I like to convey you. The conventional energy sources such as natural gas, coal, oil or nuclear are finite, but they still hold the majority of the energy market. See, the coal is 29%, hydro energy is 29%, nuclear energy is 28%, and these are all the conventions. So in the middle figure is showing you how the uh, shale gas is extracted by. So these are all areas where geoscientists are required. And nuclear energy for which geoscientist is a must for understanding about gas hydrates, where it is and all, geoscientists can help. So harnessing clean energy sources also we can play, geoscientists can play a major role and wave energy, how we can play, what is the height of the wave, periodicity of the wave, everything and geothermal energy we can get in New Zealand and all wherein we drill deep holes and from the volcanogenic heat we are getting the steam to uh, run the turbines and this is how this is a modern uh, way of doing things like carbon sequestration. It is a process because we know that the climate is changing. We cannot allow this carbon to be around, but it has to be captured and stored. And these are the mechanism uh, which uh, we can do and geoscientists can help in identifying the geological storage, ocean storage and mineral carbonation are the processes by which we can uh, remove excess carbon and control the climate in future. It's a future activity. Next. So this is a very, very important area now geoscientists are looking for because when we are going for cleaner energy, nuclear energy is the cleaner energy, but it is producing, see the amount of waste generated in India is around four tons per gigawatts. But now India has crossed seven gigawatts annual production using nuclear source. So how much and how much nuclear waste is getting into our kitty? So we have to remove it. How it is done? First is immobilization by using vitrified borrow silicate glasses. Then we have the engineered interim storage uh, done. Then the ultimate storage is vitrified based uh, deep geological repository, which I have seen in UK. Uh, <coughs> then next. See the, how we can do it. This is a, giving you uh, the roles of geoscientists in nuclear waste disposal of uh, various regions. So we can understand the rock composition, rock structure, fractures, all the everything. So for a repository, what we need is, uh, we have an underground mechanism to be in place. And that is what you are, we have shown in the right hand side down below, that is 250 meters beneath. So this is a modern geology, geo, this uh, nuclear, um, what is uh, this waste uh, repository under construction in Finland. So there are several tunnels and it's a high tech process that we are adopting to contain the nuclear waste. It should not, uh, next. It should not get out of the system. That is very important. There are several safeguards in place and I feel that these are all melting into the rocks and will be safe for future generation to come. And with this, I end my talk and I am open for discussion and I acknowledge all the, you know, uh, sites and the people. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Nantakumar for a very exciting talk and sharing a lot of basic information of geosciences and uh, uh, giving very nice illustrations and animations to make it simple. So I have received several questions out of which few I have selected and kept it for you. So kindly read the question one by one and answer.
The country formation, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, the first question, kindly clarify about Gondwana land and the country formation. It is, uh, Gondwana land is something that existed up to maybe 200 million years ago and that has split into various, uh, you know, continents. Especially the, I told that in the south of Equator, the previous continents, uh, this Pangaea has been turned into, uh, you know, Gondwana land and uh, Laurasia, wherein uh, this Gondwana, uh, after that, um, 120 million years ago, India started its movement towards the north and uh, hit the, um, the, what you call the Asian continent, Eurasian continent. And during that period, I'm very, can I play the slide once more because how the Deccan tribes are formed, as I told, there are some, um, some hot spots that developed uh, during the moment, uh, already there during the moment of uh, Indian, uh, you know, plate towards north, which I told was the fastest uh, recorded one in the history of uh, uh, this movements of continents. And when that Indian continent, uh, Marion plot was not, uh, spot was not con connected with uh, Deccan tribes, but it was responsible for um, the formation of, uh, you know, the disengagement of Madagascar from India. But the reunion plot was responsible for the contract formation. And I very clearly illustrated how the Deccan traps have erupted in the form of fishes uh, when India moved uh, above this uh, uh, reunion uh, hotspot. So I think the person can review once more, see the animation that is already there in the video. See, and uh, he can learn more about uh, the formation while reading also. So we will go into the next question. What is the next question, please? What if the magnetic pole reversals during the reversal process, what will happen to Earth and its lives? Okay, I told you that uh, the magnetic reversals are simply just happening and uh, there is no periodicity for the reversals. I already told, there's no periodicity. It, 183 reversals happened in 83 million years. And my dear friend, you will not notice anything other than, you know, pipes. See, in the North Pole, when you open the tap in the sink, the water will move in the clockwise direction. It will start going in the anti-clockwise direction. That's all. And don't panic that such a reversal is coming and you are going. You will not be affected in any way with all these things. But there will be changes, appreciable changes. Even the Aurora Borealis or Aurora Australis, is, it will never get affected because it moves. The magnetic lines moves into the ionosphere and it interacts with the whether it is North Pole or South Pole, it will interact with the coming, uh, you know, uh, sun's uh, particles and this phenomena will continue. So don't get panic about that. Okay, then the third thing is, what is the depth of deepest borehole made by human uh, earth? What are the potential challenges in borehole drilling technology. I think in Russia, they have gone almost 10 kilometers down, or maybe some, maybe 10 or 12 kilometers down. But what is this 12 kilometers compared to the radius of the earth? It's simply skin deep. Huh? So it will not get any, any problem for anybody, but Drilling technology should be so effective and efficient as and when it goes into the depth. 
See, I am very much conversing with the uh, drilling technique in the offshore areas wherein, see, the, the drill platform should not move. See, it is, uh, it is balanced automatically so that it goes down and uh, technology is very uh, at a high end to drill up to 12 kilometers. So, uh, there won't be a problem uh, for drilling also and you cannot penetrate. See, since many people, when I was a child, I was asking my parents, why don't we drill a hole to reach America? It is very easy. If you drill from India, it will penetrate the other side. So why don't we go in that hole? But these are all only fiction, but in normal way, it is not possible. So I think what are the potential challenges in borehole drilling? Yes, challenges is because of the pressure and heat that is generated inside the bowels of the earth. And there is, you know, we can make uh, the hardest material is a diamond. We can use diamond drill, but beyond which when diamond is melting, what will you do? So that is the constraint. So we have a lot of constraints to go deeper and deeper. But that's why I told you, in order to understand the inside of the earth, we will rely on seismology than any other technology. Seismology can give you so much of, uh, it, it, it can act like a CT scanner for earth. So what is, next question is, what is degree of accuracy of geomagnetic evidence for justifying <coughs> What is that? Justifying plate tectonics, continental drift theory, and see. Uh, yeah, so that's a very simple question. I showed you that uh, in the in the mid oceanic ridge, uh, Henry Hess, he actually during the uh, his uh, expedition, he found on either side of this oceanic ridge, you know. Equidistantly, they are finding reversals. See, uh, as we understood, when a plate is spreading, it spread in a uniform way. On either side, it goes, and he found that magnetization in one direction. If you uh, from center of that axis to that particular point, if it is a normal magnetization, if you can measure the same on the other side, it is giving the same reversal. Likewise, that's what is called the, he only proposed the theory of continental spreading from the mid-oceanic grids. And uh, it is highly accurate, I tell my dear friend, because of that only we have, we have, uh, you know, finalized or we have, uh, you know, came to an understanding what Henry Hess and uh, uh, Alfred Beckner's theory was true that continents move. I told you either the pole should move or the continent should move. So we are clinging evidence to show that continent is what that is moving. That is what is called, we call as continental wandering, pole wandering. Our paleomagnetic specialists will say, Wandering of poles. Wandering of poles is not poles will wander, but continents will wander. We have, I have shown, when you see, you don't find anything, but when you take into millions of years scale, you can understand that continent is wandering. Then the another question, fifth question, how, how do we identify the volcanic, volcanic prone locations? What about landslide early warning system for question mark? So, uh, my dear friend is telling about the volcanic prone locations. I told you all the, uh, you know, the ring of fire, the con that plate boundaries are prone for volcanism. Of course, in such areas, landslides are happening. But please be uh, reassured that in the Western Ghats, we don't have any active volcanoes where volcano can be a cause to for landslides. It is no, it is not like that. See, as far as uh, landslide monitoring is concerned in the Western Guards, what we are doing is we are trying three different technologies to understand or to predict 
a landslide warning. Maybe before one hour, two hour, we will get an idea which is going to fail. Even otherwise, with uh, landslide zonation mapping and all, we will be able to tell you where landslide uh, susceptibility areas are. But for a real situation, when you talk about a real situation, that is what we are trying to uh, emulate and uh, install in no time. In very quickly, we are going for it. One is we are understanding the acoustics properties of the soil, the rocks, and understand the creep mechanism which will eventually culminate to a landslide, a uh, big landslide. And number two is we are going in for tilt meters and tilt meters also can indicate the, the slope movements or the tilting that is happening. That means simply the movement that is happening in the Western Ghats. One minute. And the third is the borehole technology, which is uh, we are going to have a understanding with uh, in a, a university in uh, Kerala itself, Amrita University, where they have tried the borehole sensors. In, but that sensors are really costly. But we will apply in areas which can be affected with landslides uh, near to uh, large population areas. But the other thing, acoustic emission things and acoustic uh, monitoring things, can, it is like a toy type of an instrument. We can, we can experiment in various slopes and conditions and uh, rainfall situations and things like that. So anything more I need to answer? Uh, thank you, Dr. Nandagumar. You have also answered all the questions. And thank you. Thank you for uh, sparing your time for this webinar on behalf of all the teams uh, conducting this webinar. Thank you very much. Welcome. We can go offline now. Thank you, Dr. Mandarma. We have also answered all the questions. Thank you for uh, 